Thank you, David, for, for this invitation and the opportunity to present my book before uh, your students, uh, uh, which I know they are one of the best readers in economics, I mean, the students in general. So, so thank you. Uh, I sent two, two chapters of the book, uh, one on the MMT, Modern Monetary Theory, and the other on the currency crisis in the 90s. Uh, and I decided, I don't know if the discussants uh, uh, have uh, read, I don't know, have read the two, the two chapters, but I decided to, uh, well, I have a problem here, okay. I decided to, to combine the two uh, and to present first a critique of uh, the MMT theory, and then uh, uh, and then uh, some 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 words about the the, the three generation uh, of uh, currency crisis uh, and the role uh, they played in the what I call the dollarization of uh, of the world. So just um, uh, b before. Be before uh, dealing with MMT, just a few words about, about the book uh, called Money and Capital. When I started uh, writing uh, the book, my intention was just to update uh, one famous Marxist uh, named Suzanne de Brunoff, uh, whose great contribution to Marxi Marxist theory of money was uh, that whatever the form of money, commodity or fiduciary, whatever the objective of mon monetary policies, money always imposes what she calls an irreducible market constraint uh, on the production and exchange of commodities, so that you can never bring about the transformation in the sphere of production, distribution, and employment on the basis of uh, monetary operations. As soon as social exchange is mediated by money, the law of value will impose itself on economic agents more or less directly, more or less uh, remotely. But the more I studied monetary theories and debates uh, in relation to the Marxian theory of money, the more I discovered a deeper contradiction uh, in the order of money than uh, the one uh, pointed out by, by Suzanne de Brunoff. And this contradiction which runs through the entire history of monetary thought and practice, arises from the fact that money fulfills both social functions and private functions. And I realize that the originality, if not the superiority, of Marx's theory of money comes from the fact that it has accounted for this contra contradiction through a genesis of the general equivalent, <coughs> which posits money as a unity of uh, what I call the form of general exchangeability through which it fulfills its social functions and the general form of, va uh, of value through which uh, it constitutes a private wealth uh, par excellence. <coughs> Thus Marx's theory of the general equivalent differs from other approaches to money neither in the link it establishes between money and labor value nor in the way the money, that money emerges from the contradictory development of commodity, nor even in the unity of uh, the functions the genesis of money determines, but because it defines money as the unity of its two modes of being, the form of, ge of general exchangeability and the general form of value. Each of these modes of being translate into well-known monetary functions repeated uh, in all the textbooks, the social functions of measure of value or, or unit of, uh, of account uh, and means of exchange on the one hand and the private functions of hoarding and store of value uh, on the other. Yet all the debates, all the conflicts between monetary theories rely on the opposition between approaches favoring the one or the other mode uh, of being. And similarly, the entire history of the dollar that I trace in the, in the book from the First World War to the present day is driven by the contradiction between these two modes of being, between the social and private functions that it fulfills insofar as, uh, unlike gold, 
it is a universal currency, but issued by a particular state. So let's turn to, um, to, to the chapter uh, on, uh, on MMT. Uh, so to, to, to illustrate it, the, the, the one-sided conception of money in uh, heterodox theories, and since the session has since the session is dedicated uh, to, to the dollar, I would like to show how, through a series of successive uh, confusions, MMT separates money. Okay, okay. MMT separates money from the market, and in so doing, frees it from any market constraints so as to promise monetary policy a freedom of action that is quite extravagant uh, in relation to the role and functions uh, of money in the monetary production economy. And this will be the occasion to examine the relationship Okay. And this will be the occasion to examine the relationship between the circuit theory understood so understood. Yes. <laughs> understood in the broad sense of the term and what I call uh, a political theory uh, of value uh, uh, as opposed to, to economic theories of value. And finally, I will address the profound imperialism of MMT lying within its promises regarding monetary policy. As I just told you, the two modes of money on which I emphasize arise from the development of an exchange process during which the commodity becomes the general equivalent. But for MMT, money, as you know, is very different. It is a debt issued by a sovereign state whose character as a general means of payment lies in the obligation to pay taxes by means of this money itself. But before addressing the first point, just a word about the historical context and the theoretical framework of, uh, of MMT. The historical context is, of course, the end of the gold exchange standard and uh, the reinforced hegemony of the dollar from the, the, the 80s onwards. The theoretical framework is that proposed by Keynes in his refutation of the learnable funds theory, which made investment and therefore the credit granted by banks to firms depend on savings are previously accumulated. For Keynes and post Keynesian, uh, on the contrary, loans make deposits and deposits make reserves and the demand for money induces the supply of money. But the experience of the US's deficit without tears has pushed monetary heterodoxy to a bold version. Since modern bank credit re relies on fiat money payment system that is entirely free of its metallic base, why impose artificial liquidity constraints on banks if the government whose legal tender is money can issue unlimited money since its debt will be financed by taxation and that it satisfies the desire of private agents for cash. Thus MMT has uh, resurrected uh, Knapp's old charterlist uh, theory according to which since money is a creature of the law only the state determines by fixing the unit of account and describing its material support, the valuableness as one uh, of money, to be distinguished from the value of money. But above all, since the state has always intervened to regulate the unit of measurement, to fix the monetary name of precious met metals, and to guarantee their weight and fineness, new chartalism, like most monetary theories since the formation of modern states, has confused the value measuring uh, function of money as it arises from trade in goods with the unit of account as it results from the state's fixing of the price standard. But these two functions must be distinguished, even in a regime of inconvertible uh, state money. Hello. In its primary function, money, like uh, any other commodity, has a variable value. Even if we disregard the forex market, the exchange value of money, considered as a simple unit of account, varies constantly 
with the value of all goods whose price is expressed uh, in this unit. It should be added that as soon as it, is, as it raised the question of the exchange rate of money, uh, that is the external value of money, charitalism abandons its principles and sticks to a strictly market conception of money. More generally, the carelessness with which MMT treats the relationship between state and market is due to its definition of the nature of money. According to MMT, money is a claim or credit constituted by social relation that exist independently of the production and exchange uh, of commodities. The confusion that this conception causes between debt and money, between money and credit, comes from the fact that money is defined both as an instrument of debt and as it is a general means of payment, as a means of debt settlement. However, even if the unit of account must be distinguished from all forms of money in circulation, as well uh, as from all forms of credit, credit is distinguished from money by the fact that payment in money defines not a promise of repayment, but the unwinding of a debt relationship. But Ingham, for example, but all the MMT magic magicians also, confuses money with the promise of payment because in contemporary societies, there are two forms of debt that combine these opposite qualities, namely state money and bank money. In both cases, the confusion between money and credit stem from the fact that government money and bank money both represent a debt on oneself issued in connection with a claim against one's debtor, a debt on oneself that the creditor issues in order to transfer it to a debtor. Money is a debt with which the creditor pays uh, a debtor. It thus forms both a means of payment between buyers and sellers of goods and a promise of payment, which, unlike the bill of exchange, for example, is drawn on the creditor herself who undertakes to accept it in order to extinguish the debt of her debtor. Nevertheless, behind the apparent similarity of their forms, the debt relationships described by bank money and state money actually conceal major differences in their role and functions in monetary circulation. In the case of bank debt, money is advanced as a means of financing as money capital. But in the case of state debt, money is spent as a means of purchase, as anticipated income. In the first case, the bank merely interposes itself between the firm and the wage earner and takes, takes in the form of interest a part of the product produced by the worker without uh, equivalent. In the second case, the state confronts society as a whole and directly appropriates a part of the social product. In the first case, money is issued as credit money before flowing back as a means of payment. In the second case, it is advanced as a general equivalent before flowing back as a means of settlement. Of course, in both cases, money is issued on the basis of a prior debt relationship, bank loan on the one hand, tax obligation uh, on the other. But in the first case, the bank issues a debt on oneself that it transfers to its debtor. In the second case, the state issues a claim directly on its debtor. It is in this sense that in a fiat money payment system, the general equivalent character of money results from taxation. What places state money at the top of the payment system is therefore that the state resorts only to itself for reimbursement. But MMT, which is concerned only with the form of debt, confuses bank debt and state debt, and by confusing them, transforms the banking system into a pure and simple mechanism for transmitting uh, state expenditures and collecting taxes. In a sense, we could say that MMT uh, merely systematizes the practice of, of the central bank, which also consists of issuing money debt general equivalent. But precisely, as the bank of the banks, it must limit itself uh, to converting the private money of commercial banks 
into the ultimate uh, means of payment. And the whole debate uh, about its, its function as a lender of, la of last resort concerns the boundary between the creation uh, of money without equivalent and the creation of money that ensures the uh, unity of a system of payments that the central bank does not originate, actually. But for MMT, the separation of monetary and fiscal functions and the formal independence uh, of the central bank from the treasury is artificial. And with the consolidation of their status and functions, the financial system would fulfill a functional role à la Lerner, à la Abba Lerner, at the service of the policies of uh, the issuing state. Under these conditions, the issuance of T-bills would no longer constitute a loan intended to finance government spending, but a means of regulating the interest rate by absorbing the excess reserves created by the government itself. It would no longer be an instrument of fiscal policy, but of monetary policy. Conversely, monetary policy would be transformed into fiscal policy. <laughs> the state would become the principal employer and the general equivalent character of its currency uh, would no longer derive uh, solely from the obligation to pay taxes into it, but from the fact that it would directly pay the entire social labor force. In a sense, MMT simply draws radical conclusion from what money has always been for post-Keynesian theory, namely a social relationship of indebtedness based on state power, even if this power is embodied by the central bank. In reality, money is separated from the market twice in MMT. Not only is money not born of market relations, according to MMT, but there is no money without state. This is why, in the absence of a theor uh, theory of economic value, MMT, but it is also true of uh, theories of indigenous money with a, an ex exogenous interest rate, has developed a political theory of value according to which the price of money and goods results from the conflict between the only social classes recognized by these theories, namely debtors and creditors. The main expression of this conflict is the interest rate uh, set by the central bank. As you perhaps know, MMT has often been criticized for neglecting the international constraints uh, that uh, in an economy open to the outside world would weigh on its deficit policy uh, through money creation, either, even under a flexible exchange rate regime important inflation, flight from money, etc. Add to this the total lack of consideration uh, of the effects of this policy on developing countries. And MMT reveals what I call its profound monetary imperialism by attributing to modern money all the exorbitant privileges attached to the dollar. Deficits indefinitely financed by, by international savings, indifference to depreciation or appreciation, the former stimulating trade and income from abroad, the latter facilitating, facilitating foreign investment itself, etc. A close look at the nature of these different constraints shows us that they actually affect the dollar either in its relationship to other currencies or in its role as a reserve asset. That is the currency as a commodity. Now, since the only social relation that MMT considers is the relation between debtor and creditor, the only market quality that is supposed to attribute to money is the interest rate. And since, since it neutralizes the binding force of this quality by positing the exogenous nature of the interest rate, the definition of money as a mere IOU allows MMT to evacuate any market constraint from the borders of its uh, monetary zone, zone and thus to found the possibility of uh, an unlimited budget deficit. And, and that through the mere play of money issue and taxation. Contrary to 
Connolly statement to the cranky Europeans uh, that, that uh, the, dollar, the dollar is our money, but it is your problem. Uh, the dollar is not MMT's money, but it is their problem. This is because on the foreign exchange market and in the savers' portfolios, money immediately presents itself as a general form of value. And in the case of the dollar, as a universal equivalent. In other words, as the equivalent of all commodities, including other currencies. The paradox of all theories of credit money is that why they conceive of money directly in the form of money capital, they interpret the supply of and demand for money as a supply of and demand for simple means of circulation. So now I would like to, to show how uh, after the end of the Bretton Woods agreements, uh, the dollar came to be seen as a universal currency, thanks to crises, whose conditions of emergence, as well as the ways in which uh, they were managed and resolved, enabled it to penetrate deeply in the economies of Latin America, as well as uh, those of the countries of uh, Southeast uh, Asia. More specifically, we will see that each generation of currency crisis from uh, 1982 to the late 90s has seen the dollar penetrate further into the economic and social activity of the regions uh, hit by the crisis. But before discussing this crisis, I would like to start by saying a few words about uh, the exchange rates uh, problem as it arisen for economists and uh, monetary policy makers uh, in the wake of uh, financial globalization. Oh. With the liberalization of the foreign exchange market and the capital account, the exchange rate has ceased to reflect uh, the state of the current account and is instead depends on international capital movements and financial transactions based on expectations about uh, the evolution of interest rates and exchange rates themselves. These transactions are a hundred times higher than those related to trade. Yet these capital movements in no way fulfill the balancing role dictated by the laws of international trade. Sometimes they compensate for, sometimes they aggravate the effects of the current account, thus causing last, lasting misalignments in exchange rates. As the specialist said, gone are the days when the lasting surplus logically allowed the country to see its currency uh, appreciate. And these movements can hardly be relied upon to monitor uh, exchange rate trends. We have seen in some currencies We've seen some currencies appreciate or stabilize without outflows, uh, 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 sorry, while outflows accelerated. It was the case of the Dutch mark in 86 and 87 and the French franc in 94. And the reason is that not only does the, distinct, the distinction between residents and non-residents no longer cover capital movements, but more and more currency transaction between residents themselves are weighing on the foreign exchange market, interbank transactions, risk edging, uh, etc. Conversely, when non-residents buy domestic assets with funds borrowed from domestic banks, they leave a trace on the balance of capital, but none on the foreign exchange market. Finally, when capital movements influence exchange rates, it is because of the inertia uh, of prices relative to the extreme mobility of speculative capital that they increase their volatility. This is why financial operators' assessment of the ability of the monetary authorities to maintain a non-inflationary domestic policy geared towards uh, nominal exchange rate stability is a much more important determinant of the exchange rate uh, than the competitiveness indicated by the current account uh, balance. Under these conditions, 
interest in studying the determinants of uh, exchange rates has grown in inverse proportion uh, to, the, to the development of financial globalization, in which operators give less credence uh, to uh, fundamental economic variables, which are supposed to influence exchange rates, than to past uh, developments, even and especially when they contradict uh, these, uh, these variables. Thus, with financial liber liberalization, the notion of an equilibrium exchange rate, according to which the exchange uh, ratio between two currencies express, uh, expresses the price difference between goods of the same kind traded on international markets, lost all meaning. The monetary authorities, therefore, had to develop new criteria for influencing the exchange rate uh, of their currency. This is how Williamson, the man behind the Washington Consensus, uh, whose effects on the fate of Latin America uh, in the 90s, we shall analyze uh, straight away, came up with the, th the theory of target zones, in which the equilibrium exchange rate is said to be fundamental when, in the medium term, the securities market is assumed to be uh, in equilibrium uh, and wealth I mean, the stock of assets is considered to be stable. In reality, the writer of the Ten Commandments of Financial Globalization was acknowledging that for the markets, the equilibrium exchange rate defines noth nothing more than the rate relative to which certain essential variables, such as a balance of payments deficit, are seen to be sustainable. In other words, financeable by external loans. The greater the financial openness of a country, the greater the margin of sustainability of its deficit in the eyes uh, of, uh, of, of the operators. But also the greater the mobility of capital and with it the risks, the risks of uh, exchange rate uh, crisis. <clears throat> However, the source of all the misunderstandings about the exchange rate crisis, which followed one another from the 80s onwards, lies in the fact that the effects of financial liberalization were confused with the key role of the dollar uh, in the post Bretton Woods currency hierarchy. Calvo and Goldstein, for example, pointed out that, uh, pointed out at that time that the, the liberalization of uh, the capital account triggered uh, a substitution of foreign assets for domestic assets, which increased exposure to exchange rate risk and the risk of default. In monetary terms, financial globalization means nothing other than the globalization of the dollar. But irrespective of the fact that the dollar's universal role had been prepared for a long time, the floating exchange rate regime cannot do without a reference currency. Even in, in the absence of a central currency, there is a hierarchical compromise between the need for an international unit of account and the need to maintain the specificity of national currencies, domestic currencies. With the liberalization of the foreign ex exchange market and hence international financial competition, this hierarchy is expressed in the level of priority given to the external objectives of low inflation and high returns on money over the internal objectives of growth, employment, social protection, and so on. It may be said that only the USA, as an issuer of the reserve currency, is spared <coughs> this concern. But the dollar's international role also needs it to meet the new international standards of finance, even if this means for the USA increasing inequality, reducing uh, real wages, and making the labor market as flexible as possible. So let's now let's turn now to the to the currency crisis uh, uh, themselves. <clears throat> Referring to the cycle of uh, international financial crisis in the 90s. A specialist said, as a profession, we simply do not have a very good understanding of what causes crisis, especially currency crisis. 
and even wonder whether these currency crises really had macroeconomic causes. This is because just as exchange rate theories presuppose the existence of a common unit of account in their models of real exchange rates, crisis analysis presuppose the existence of reference currencies with, without re -realiza realizing that these currencies do not sim simply serve as an anchor uh, for uh, domestic currencies. They also fulfill monetary functions, the modalities of which give crises their particular forms. We shall therefore see that what economists have called the three generations of uh, currency crises are less generations of models than stages in the growth of the dollar as uh, a universal uh, equivalent. However, <clears throat> the Mexican crisis of, of uh, 82, the first big currency crisis, post Bretton Woods currency crisis, which marks uh, what has, has been called the first generation of currency crisis. And though it represents the, the first major exchange rate crisis uh, after uh, the abolition of the fixed exchange, exchange rate system was not caused by the floating of the peso uh, against the dollar. On the contrary, the defense of the fixed exchange rate was one of the factors that led to the crisis in the first place. Nor did the crisis owe its brutality and severity to financial liberalization. Mexico had not yet liberalized uh, its capital account and its public debt had not been securitized at that time. But it was the first great crisis of universalization, not out of, of the dollar as a simple key currency, but of the dollar as money capital, as universal financial capital issued by the central bank of a national country guided uh, by its own uh, interests. This is how, after years of massing borrowing on the euro dollar market, the emerging countries were hit by the combined effects of uh, Volcker's decision to raise uh, US interest rates, thereby increasing their level of indebtedness and the rise in commodity prices on which depended their trade. The Mexican government soon declared that it was suspending payment of its debt, excluding uh, interest. But what turned the external debt crisis into a currency crisis was that in order to win the confidence of uh, foreign investors, Mexico had switched to a fixed exchange rate with the dollar after years of uncontrolled uh, inflation. The, ri the rise in the dollar worsened Mexico's balance of payments, which had already deteriorated uh, as a result uh, of the loss of competitiveness of Mexican products and the fall uh, in the price of oil, of which Mexico was a major supplier. It is true that the balance of payments had been worsened, uh, above all by the continual increase in public spending fueled by the government's dollar borrowing. But the effects of this borrowing on the balance of payments were essentially due to the increase of in the debt uh, burden uh, caused by the rise in uh, US interest rates. Similarly, infl inflation rates close to 100% were indeed Mexico's problem. But the rise in these rates was itself fueled by capital flight accelerated by successive peso, peso devaluations. It is therefore the combination of, of rising interest rates, the value of the dollar and the flight of capital in dollars that gives the Mexican crisis its specificity and explain its scale relative to the fundamentals of the, on the deterioration of uh, which is based on uh, the first generation currency crisis uh, models. In these three effects of the dollarization of Mexican public debt, what is expressed is the contradiction between the dollar acting as financial capital and the peso as a means of circulation. The equivalent of goods and services both traded on international market and spent in the domestic sphere. In this sense, the 82 crisis is less an expression of the contradiction between the need to anchor 
the currency and the mobility of capital, uh, which Aiken Green sees, sees as uh, the ultimate source of the hills of the ills of the financial globalization. Then of the contradiction imminent in borrowing in dollars to finance economic policies applied to a monetary area in which the local currency continues to fulfill the functions as a unit of account and uh, as a, a, a medium of exchange. If fundamentals play a role in the first generation currency crisis, this is because they relate to transactions and expenditure carried out in domestic currency, whereas the source of these transactions and expenditure depended on the key currency uh, of the uh, international monetary system. Why the government, although running a capitalist state, fulfilled the internal collective functions through the social functions of domestic currency, it depended on creditors for whom the dollar fulfilled a private function of monetary capital. After the debt crisis triggered by changes in US monetary policy, these government bonds were replaced by market instruments such, uh, such as Brady bonds at the request of the bank themselves, which, which were seeking to develop more active management of their portfolios. But once offshore banks had dollarized their treasuries, investors began to dollarize the, the financial market uh, of uh, emerging uh, countries. And so the second generation uh, crisis, uh, with the second uh, Mexican crisis of, uh, of 94, which has been described uh, as a second generation because of its self-fulfilling effect due to the predominance of the financial sector in dollar-denominated uh, instruments. Unlike the 82 crisis, therefore, this was less a solvency crisis than a liquidity crisis triggered by a market reversal. But it has not been sufficiently emphasized that this generational change reflected a change in the role of the dollar in the nature of this crisis. Unlike 82, the entire private sector found itself exposed to the dollar and at the mercy of dollar investors. The financial liberalization that began after the first crisis and was accelerated by the Washington Consensus actually meant the financial globalization of the dollar itself. Compared with 82, the Mexican economy in 94 was different in that with the deregulation of the financial markets and the reprivatization of the banks, not only were the markets open to the issue and circulation of foreign securities, but the banks borrowed massively in dollars to fuel a debauch of mortgages and consumer loans. Whereas in, 90, in 82, it was a case of direct government indebtedness in dollars to private banks, 12 years later, it was a case of uh, an indirect indebtedness mediated by the capital market in addition to the banks. So let's look at the background of this new influx of dollars into Mexico. First of all, depressed economic activity in the USA, Canada, and the UK, and the resulting fall in the interest rates fueled investors' appetites for emerging markets with high growth potential. Then there was debt deflation in Japan with falling prices for securities, land <laughs> and the yen, as well as the first Iraq war and rising oil prices. Above all, it was the triple financial revolution ratified by the Washington Consensus. And in the case of Mexico, the Brady plan organizing the securitization of Mexican debt, deregulation of the market, internationalization of capital and the financial innovation uh, launched by, uh, by Brady Bonds, among others. The active role played by institutional investors who were given free reign to uh, diversify their investments under these reforms encouraged the inflow of capital from advanced countries, which rose from $65 billion a year in the year 
to 460 billion in uh, 1889. This influx was made all the easier by the fact that from 89 onwards, Mexico had gone from prodigal son to model child. The budget became in surplus in 92-93. Inflation was reduced to single digit levels and GDP accelerated its growth while becoming less dependent on oil exports than it had been in the early 80s. This transformation was re re rewarded by Mexico's entry uh, into the GATT, uh, la later the WTO, and the, the, and the OECD, and above all by the signing of free trade agreements with the USA and Canada. Nevertheless, the gradual depreciation of the exchange rate did not prevent its real appreciation due to the resumption of inflation uh, after uh, 1990. Yet the resulting current account deficit was easily financed by capital inflows. And in fact, foreign exchange reserves continued to rise until the first quarter of 94. In the meantime, however, interest rates rose in the USA, both long rates and the federal funds rate, following monetary tightening uh, by the Fed. The government was only responsible for the resulting inflation to the extent that it borrowed itself by issuing dollar-denominated treasury bills, uh, which were called the Teso Bonos. On the eve of the crisis, the Mexican economy owed more or less all of its financing to the US dollar. The larger the balance of payments deficit, the more the government borrowed to maintain uh, its uh, exchange rate. However, political events provided a rational basis for the sudden reversal of capital uh, flows. The assassination of uh, the prior candidate uh, in the 94 election and, and the unfortunate announcement by his elected successor of a new team at the Ministry of Finance, together with the decision to widen the exchange rate band, precipitated capital withdrawals and soon the floating of the peso. Not only these political events justify in hindsight, the fears of investors uh, who would have used even more innocuous events as a pretext to, to initiate uh, the, the downturn. But the markets react, reacted brutally to the only measures the government had to take in these circumstances, namely to loosen the, stra the stranglehold of the exchange rate uh, on the Mexican economy. Observers were surprised to discover that neither the current account deficit nor the budget deficit appear to play an important role in the currency crisis of emerging countries. All the factors considered, on the other hand, involve both a reference currency as a financial asset and the price of this reference currency, that is, the interest rate. But given the strangeness of this crisis in relation to the traditional variables affecting exchange rates, we just saw in them the effect of a strategic game between the markets and the authorities. And uh, to explain the crisis as a result of a mere self-fulfilling prophecy. So let's take a look to the third generation uh, crisis. Don Bush uh, has contrasted uh, the old style crises, which are mainly linked to real exchange rate distortion and uh, unsustainable external imbalances, with the new style uh, balance sheet crisis, the source of which lies uh, in, bank in banking fragilities. However, Third generation models are generally identified by the banking liquidity crisis that goes along the currency crisis. By doubling financial crises with banking crises, third generation currency crisis models confirmed the presence of the dollar at all, stage, at all stages of the financial intermediation in uh, uh, peripheral currency areas. This change is reflected 
in the fact that the indicator of fragility is no longer expressed by the ratio between the level of foreign exchange reserves and the balance of payment deficits, but by the ratio between these reserves and the amount of short-term external debt. The question is therefore not whether the crisis is the ex expression of a banking liquidity problem or whether it is the unavoidable outcome of uh, deteriorated fundamentals. The question is whether the exchange rate plays a role in both the liquidity crisis and the deterioration uh, of, uh, in fundamentals. It is true that the banking crisis that uh, accompany the currency crisis sanctioned the over indebtedness uh, of the banks. But this coupling with the currency crisis would be a coincidence if other indicators did not give the twin crisis their specificity. The ratio of banks' external liabilities to GDP, the interest rates of creditors' countries, or the spreads of emerging country debtors. Under a fixed exchange rate regime, banks are unaware that they are taking on an exchange rate risk. By accepting deposits and loans in dollars, any questioning of the parity can only precipitate the banking crisis. Even if the banking system were properly supervised, a change in parity would shift all the risk onto the banking system. Because in emerging countries, banks are responsible for a larger share of financial intermediation than in most uh, advanced countries. In this case, the causality runs from the currency crisis to the banking crisis and not vice versa, as economic studies are using panel data teaches. There are not therefore collateral effects of banking crisis, as Krugman, for example, believes. The banking crisis could not have been provoked without the currency crisis. So let's take a brief look at how banking crises are triggered. To justify the insane orgy of short-term loans in foreign currencies, in dollars, granted by international banks to Asian banks before the 1997 crisis, one did not hesitate to condemn governments for having implicitly guaranteed these loans, either directly or in the indirectly through IMF, IMF uh, support programs, thus creating a moral hazard, in other words, an apparent neglect of the standards for sound risk assessment. The ratio of short-term foreign liabilities to foreign exchange reserves was over 100% in Korea, uh, Indonesia, and Thailand. And on the eve of the crisis, in terms of exchange rates, the appreciation of the dollar and depreciation of the yen led uh, to uh, a loss of com competitiveness in the region, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Japan and more generally to an appreciation in the exchange rate, albeit uneven, of currencies pegged to, to the dollar. But the level of appreci appreci appreciation remained modest compared with the appreciation of the peso before the Mexican crisis. If we look at the estimates of the central ba of the, the, the World Bank, none of the countries uh, hit by the crisis presented a serious problem. Indeed, the debt GDP uh, ratio for many of these countries had remained relatively low, and the share of short-term debt in total indebtedness, also increasing, had remained quite small. The only worrying indicate, indicator concerned the ratio of foreign liabilities to foreign assets. Domestic banks had borrowed heavily from foreign banks in order to lend to domestic investors. If the excess borrowing and the resulting crisis can be explained by the weakness of the banking and financial systems, this weakness explains neither the, neither the form in which the crisis hit Asia nor the spread of the crisis to countries that were not experiencing uh, overinvestment. The large evaluations that followed the first depreciations were due to market reaction to monetary policies and at limiting the outflow, the outflow of capital and above all speculative pressure on the foreign exchange market in order to avoid too strong 
a monetary contraction and too high an interest rate rise. What does this mean? It means that the authorities choose to progressively relax their exchange rate at the same time as they sought to control capital. The crisis was therefore directly caused by the market's aversion to countries' attempt to regain monetary and financial sovereign sovereignty. So, the three generations of currency crises we have traced have therefore contributed to the creation of what is now known as a dollar zone, alongside the eurozone and the yen and or yuan zone. Indeed, these crises, and later uh, the 2008 crisis, in no way slowed the financial integration of the global economy uh, or the pegging of currencies to key currencies, despite the diversity of exchange rate regimes. Quite the contrary. Financial crises have acted as a powerful levers for financial integration, banking concentration, and over-determination of exchange rates by reference currencies. Thus, the conflict in centralization under the aegis of the dollar is today shaping a genuine dollar zone alongside, alongside other currency zones, whether they are like the eurozone or de facto like the yen yuan zone, in which brings together economies with currencies that are relatively stable against the dollar. Within this zone, cross-border investment and borrowing in dollars imposes a zone bias on investors in their portfolio choices. This reduces uh, currency risks compared with uh, more diversified uh, portfolios. Under this approach, the dollar zone would cover 50 or 60 percent of global GDP. In reality, for both the euro and the dollar, the reduction in their respective shares of global GDP has been more than offset by growth in their respective zones. Do I have just two minutes to conclude? So, just some few final considerations. I can agree sees in the succession of financial crises after Bretton Woods the expression of the contradiction between the need to anchor currencies in some exchange rate regime and the freedom of capital movement. And it is true that all the crises in emerging uh, uh, countries invariably repeat the same scenario of capital flight coupled with the depletion of foreign exchange reserves. The only true common denominator of international financial crises is a concomitance of a currency crisis and a capital flight in several countries. But this leakage reveals a deeper contradiction in the function of money distributed on uh, an international scale between the dollar's function as universal money capital and the monetary functions as a unit of account and means of exchange of local currencies. With the liberalization of the foreign exchange market, all domestic currencies are worth as local means of circulation into which the dollar uh, is converted according to the market in which it is invested as financial capital. It is well known that the phenomenon of dollarization is measured by the number of currency functions that the dollar fulfills in place of the domestic currency. It begins when dollar reserves replace local currency reserves, asset substitution, and ends as soon as the greenback circulates from hand to hand in domestic transactions, currency substitutions. But currency crises have shown that domestic currencies do not need to give up any of their functions in order to be subordinated to a reference currency. From the moment that domestic investment or expenditure is financed by funds in dollars, for example, whether these funds are raised by borrowing or by issuing securities, the functions of the currency are redistribu redistributed between the dollar, which as loan capital acts as a store of value uh, in the domestic space, and the domestic currency, which is reduced to circulating goods within this space. The, the three generations of crises are like the three degrees of extension of the dollar's function 
as a store of value in the monetary and financial space uh, of this local space. And this extension proceeds in a top-down movement. First the state with the external debt, then the markets, and finally the banks and companies until the very laws of international trade are overturned. And it is in this capacity as a store of value that the dollar has gradually established itself as a universal equivalent, pushing the emerging markets open to it into what is now known as the dollar zone. But the domestic currencies do more than simply ensure the exchange of goods in the spaces where, where they circulate. They also function as money capital, as investment money that is valued during the very process of production and circulation of commodities. So their existence as a financial asset on the foreign exchange market depends on the capacity to reproduce themselves as a general equivalent. That is, on the capacity to represent the universal equivalent through the monetary functions they fulfill in, the, in their own spheres of exchange. And from this point of view, it matters little whether this capacity is compromised by fundamental macroeconomic variables, first generation crisis, or by ir irrational market beliefs, second generation crisis. This is because in all cases, this capacity is verified according to two criteria, the interest rate, the return on money capital, and foreign exchange reserves, the conversion into universal money capital. For the foreign exchange market, only these two variables are said to be fundamental insofar as they are the only ones to indicate to the markets the capacity of domestic currencies to represent the requirements of universal capital. Thank you.